This is Purcell, an average sized dog. Now back in the Eocene period, this was about the size of a horse. Now look at them now. It's hard to imagine. It was millions of years ago that the first horse roamed the earth. And as the environment changed, so did the animals. And therefore, the horse did too. Let's take a trip back in time. 60 million years before the emergence of human life on the planet, the first horse, or at least the earliest ancestor of the equine species as we know it, made its initial appearance on Earth. Oh, you wouldn't be throwing a halter or saddle on this little guy, because he was just that, a little guy. Scientists called the small animal from which the modern horse evolved, Eohippus, the dawn horse. The discovery of the most complete skeleton ever found of Eohippus in 1931 in the Bighorn Basin of Wyoming has given us most of what we know of this early ancestor of Northern Dancer, Big Ben, Trigger, and all the rest. Dr. Bruce Naylor is the director of paleontology at the Royal Terrell Museum in Drumheller, Alberta. In the development of life and evolution, what we believe now is, is most things are driven by environmental change. The, uh, the tertiary, that's the time, the, the last phase of Earth's history, the rise of the mammals. The dinosaurs are gone, mammals are expanding. Uh, throughout the tertiary, uh, what we see is climatic deterioration. When the very early horses were here, Heracotherium, North America was, was moist, it was, it was extensively covered by forests. Uh, there was no grass, grass basically hadn't evolved yet and uh, hadn't begun to spread. So the earliest horses uh, were living in open forests uh, by the sides of rivers, very uh, moist conditions, soft uh, substrate, and they were browsers. They weren't uh, grazers like the modern horse. They were uh, nibbling very uh, soft vegetation. Scientists believe that Eohippus had four toes on his front feet and short crowned molar teeth, both traits ideally suited to his life as a browsing animal in the tropical, jungle-like surroundings that were home. His average size was perhaps 14 inches, or 35 centimeters. Let's see, what's that, about two hands high? Uh, another reason we know that this is a horse is by tracing back through the fossil record. We know what the modern horse Equus looks like. Uh, we know uh, going back through time, and we can link up through graded series back uh, through to this animal, Mesohippus, and then ultimately to Hierakotherium or Eohippus, which is the first uh, known horse. Hierakotherium is about uh, 55 million years old. There was likely considerable variation in size, from much smaller individuals to some twice that size, and maybe even larger in the European strains. Sort of an early version of the draft horse. Eventually, about 35 to 40 million years ago, most varieties of Eohippus became extinct, except in North America, where the evolutionary process continued. Next came Mesohippus, the most notable differences being an increase in size to about 18 inches or 45 centimeters, longer legs, and the reduction to three toes from four with a prominent central toe. What we have in this case uh, in front of us is the genus Mesohippus, and we discovered this uh, back in the early 80s in a road cut in uh, southeastern Saskatchewan. And you look at the size, and your first reaction normally would be, you know, this is ridiculous, how can it be a horse? You start looking at it more carefully, and the features begin to come out. Scientists believe that the longer legs and larger skull with the eye placement more to the sides resulted in the animal relying less on concealment and more on detecting its enemies and running from them. Starting to see some resemblance to our horses yet? These changes probably coincided with the changing environment as the earlier jungle conditions gave way to wooded areas. As the climate began to deteriorate, uh, it got cooler, it got drier, and grass began to spread. So just about the entire uh, makeup of the horse, the entire, uh, what makes a horse, the physical being of a horse, we think is driven by this increased heredity 
and the horse adapting to live on grasslands and to eat grass. The change continued both in the environment and in the adaptation of these animals to that environment. 20 to 25 million years ago, a still larger version emerged, not yet the prototype of our equus, but getting closer. This guy had a longer neck with a skull shape and eye placement that allowed for more all-round vision. The temperament, based on the fight or flight mechanism that characterizes today's horses, was likely developing around this time as well. If you look at the skull of a horse, that very long um, snout that we're used to, the long uh, tooth row, uh, very high teeth, that's adapted to eating grass. When we go to our lawns, we look at grass and it looks, it's, it looks soft and inviting and everything, but grass is in fact one of the hardest, most tough things to eat. Uh, grass has got spicules of silica inside, and silica, it's, it's a kind of glass, grinds down teeth. So the silica within the grass and dust on the grass um, means that horses need this great battery of, uh, of teeth to, to handle it. There's a diastema, which is simply a gap between the teeth in the front of the mouth and the teeth in the cheek region, is beginning to open up, and that's very common for herbivores to have. Uh, the brain case is getting a little bit bigger, getting a little bit smarter, and then you can see the snout beginning to elongate as well. It's still, in comparison to the modern horse, a uh, very, uh, very primitive animal, but it's beginning to make the uh, first stages towards what we recognize today as the horse. About six million years ago, Pleohippus emerged, and this was the animal that we would recognize as the early prototype of Equus. About 12 hands high, Pleohippus had powerful legs and a single hoof. Five million years later, or a mere one million years ago, the modern horse arrived on the scene. He spread from North America via the land bridges that connected continents back then to Asia, South America, and Africa. The, the entire story of, uh, of the horse is a North American story. Arachotherium, the first known one, appeared in North America. It then migrated to Europe and Asia. Uh, the other horses appeared in North America. Um, finally, in the Pleistocene, which is, uh, we're sort of in the tail end of the Pleistocene right now, during the Ice Ages, uh, there were horses in North America, the same genus as the modern domestic horse, Equus. Uh, if you were to look at them, though, you wouldn't say horse. You'd say uh, donkey, ass, or zebra. That's the kind of animal they were. Then, about 9,000 years ago, the horse disappeared from North America. The reason for the North American extinction remains a mystery. They may have been hunted to extinction by the uh, Paleo-Indians coming in. It may have been climatic deterioration that knocked them out. It's one of those intriguing questions in paleontology that they're fascinating questions. It's fascinating to talk about them and to speculate, but regardless of the answer you come up with, there's always this niggle at the back of your mind that you really don't know, and which is kind of depressing but kind of exciting that you probably never will know. And so the horse didn't come back until the Spaniards landed in Mexico uh, for the, with the Mexican conquest, and those basically were the, the forebears of, uh, of the modern horse in North America. And so the highly developed uh, native Indians, the Sioux that were on the, uh, the, uh, the prairies, had developed a very highly developed, very sophisticated horse culture. That probably took place only within 150 or 200 years. But let's not forget tiny Eohippus and all the generations that followed. For without the dawn horse, all those mares and foals out in your pastures and mine simply wouldn't exist. Many believe that the 1946 Belmont Stakes was Assault's greatest race. It showed the world the determination and heart of the sickly little Texas chestnut three-year-old. It was listed as a slow track that May 4th, 1946, when this unlikely hero from the Lone Star State took his place in history. Today's Living Legend series looks at the life and career of the outstanding chestnut colt called Assault.
He was a most unlikely hero. A raw-boned, 15.1-hand chestnut horse with a severe disability that almost cost him his very life, but for an impeccable pedigree and an incredible heart. One of the Lone Star State's greatest legends, Assault, the club-footed comet. Fold in 1943 with the bloodline of champion Bold Venture, Assault would become the greatest stakes winner ever produced from the famed Million Acre King Ranch. Health problems had always plagued the little colt. Kidney problems, split bone, a wrenched ankle, a bad knee, and severe foot wound. As a foal, Assault had stepped on a surveyor's stake. This caused his right front hoof to be almost cut away. Even wearing a special shoe for the rest of his life, he would have a severe limp, sometimes even causing him to stumble and fall. His trainer, Max Hirsch, first wondered why the King Ranch would send him a crippled colt. It wouldn't take long for Hirsch to realize why. He saw the same magical stuff in the little chestnut that he had witnessed in the mighty Man of War. Even though Assault walked and trotted with a noticeable limp, there wasn't a thing wrong with his action when he went fast. Any shortcomings from physical ailments seemed to be made up with pure heart. By the time Assault went to Louisville to try for the 1946 Derby, he had only won four races. It's post time. Come on, yeah. Out of the gate, it was Spy Song, with knockdown following and Assault trailing in the opening mile. Classic mile and a quarter test worth $100,000, richest in Derby history. Dark Jungle third, Rippy fourth, Assault is fifth. Into the first turn, it's Spy Song, knockdown, and now Assault moves up to third. And now, entering the home stretch, Assault is moving up, coming fast on the At the top of the stretch, Warren Mertens urged Assault on. Finding an opening on the rail, Assault, Assault kept pushing, eventually gaining an eight-length lead on the rest of the field. ...with Warren Mertens up, making the run for the Roses, and the winner by eight lengths is Assault. At the wire, he would set the widest winning margin in Kentucky Derby history. The next day, Walter Haight wrote, Assault is the name, but he looked like Murder Inc. In the second jewel of the Triple Crown at Pimlico, Assault was a favorite for the first time in his career. And they're away. Closely bunched at the start. Now watch number 10, Tidy Bit on the outside, cutting fast for the rail. It's Tidy Bit moving to the front and taking the lead in this mile and 3 16th test for America's top three-year-olds. Pounding into the back stretch, neck and neck. Assault, Kentucky Derby winner, begins to move up on the outside. And now Assault overtakes Natchez. Assault is in the lead. Hampton's third, and Lord Boswell moves up to fourth. At the head of the stretch, jockey Warren Mertens on Assault opens up a three-length lead. And now they're headed for home. Assault still out front in the run for the Black-Eyed Susans. But here comes Lord Boswell. Jockey Doug Dodson gives Boswell the whip. He's closing fast on Assault. The finish and the winner, Assault by a neck, taking down 100 Gs. Many believe that the 1946 Belmont Stakes was Assault's greatest race. It showed the world the determination and heart of the sickly little Texas chestnut three-year-old. Then, out of the gate, the unthinkable happened. Assault stumbled and nearly fell. Assault regained his footing, but by the second turn was still eight lengths from the leader. Mertens then swung Assault to the outside, pushing the Comet to third place, but still two lengths behind the leader. At that moment, in a charge that was likened to jet propulsion, Assault bolted for the wire, taking it by three lengths and becoming only the seventh horse to ever win the coveted Triple Crown. To win the Triple Crown of the American Turf. In his career, Assault counted 18 victories and total winnings in excess of $674,000. He also ranked as number 33 in the top 100 thoroughbreds of the 20th century by Blood Horse Magazine. Assault, the sickly crippled chestnut with a heart as big as Texas, who came to epitomize courage and heart to a nation. The chocolate champ, the club-footed comet, a true champion in so many ways. Assault. Another living legend. Now on this side we have Satari painted with the skeletal system with the bones. And up in front you've got the skull and his lower jaw, the 
the seven bones of his neck which sweep down in that beautiful curve. Back here we have the dorsal vertebrae. Those are the ones with ribs attached, and he has about 18 pairs of ribs. And the spines stick up here and form the withers in the back that we sit on. Back here are his lumbar vertebrae. Those are the ones that aren't supported, and this is where a horse can get a sore back very easily. His sacrum, or his croup, and his tailbone. Actually, there's about 18 tailbones. And then we have the pelvis, his hip bone, point of the buttock, and his thigh bone. He has a kneecap or a patella just like we do. This is the tibia. He comes down to his hock joint, and we have his tarsal bones or hock bones, his metatarsal or hind cannon and splint bones, sesamoids, long pastern, short pastern, and down in the foot you have your coffin bone and the navicular bone. And then up here we have his shoulder blade. This is what the saddle mustn't pinch. The humerus, which forms the big bone of his arm, that's another one that's buried deep in muscle and you don't see very much on the horse. His elbow or ulna, and the radius or the big bone of his forearm. That takes you down to his carpal joint or knee joint, his cannon bone, splint bones, sesamoid, long pastern, short pastern, and down in the foot we have the coffin bone and the navicular bone. When you look at the outside of your horse, you don't see, you can see some bony landmarks. But for instance, it's pretty hard to see where your horse's hip joint is. So when you watch your horse move and you see his shoulders slide and you see his hip bone and his thigh bone swing, if people can sort of put together an understanding of how the bones work and what their horse really looks like under the skin, and it fills in some of the gaps in what we understand about how horses move. We always enjoy hearing from our viewers. And this week's Complete Rider fan email comes to us from Denise Freeland. And Denise writes, I just purchased a thoroughbred gelding off the track and we are retraining him for the hunter ring. He's quite thin and I want to know how to put some weight on him. What do you suggest? Denise, you have a very good question and it's something that bothers a lot of people when they buy horses off the track. I'm going to suggest some very common things you've probably already done about this horse. First thing, he's come off the track, he hasn't been fed a lot of hay, they typically don't. So you first thing you should do is deworm him. Second thing is get his teeth checked. Third thing, I'm assuming you've given him a layoff period, hopefully out in a larger paddock with good hay or good grass to eat. Now you're to the process of getting him to come to work. The beet pulp suggestion is a very common suggestion in the hunter-jumper world, and it has two advantages. One, it doesn't have quite as many calories as most of the other grains. Two, uh, you have to soak it thoroughly so you end up with quite a bit of bulk to do with the feed when you're feeding it so the horse takes longer to eat it. It does help satisfy them. To avoid having too much, I would use the beet pulp definitely, or you could use a reasonable amount of grain and more hay, a better quality hay, or if you're limited at the stable you're at with their hay, alfalfa cubes, and really increase the forage content of his diet. It's a slower way to put weight on, but it should avoid the problem of having him so hot that you can't ride him and can't get along with him. Jen and I look forward to seeing you again next week, and thanks for watching. See you then.